Let's pray. Father, we thank you. For we are here because of you. You know, if it wasn't for God, we wouldn't have an existence. Because he's the creator of all things. If it wasn't for Jesus, we wouldn't have the opportunity of the intimate relationship the Father desires. And if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't have the ability to live in the intimacy the Father desires. The three co-labor work together in us. So he can be great in us. He already is great. He's the greatest. But he can be great in us. So we can do his greatness on this earth. Christianity is not a lifestyle of quietness. It can be when you're meditating on him, when you're in prayer, intercession. Sometimes intercession is not quiet. It can be when you're lying in his presence. But that's not the design that we're supposed to be when we're in the world. I believe that we are supposed to, in our quiet times, receive more of his promises in our life. And so when we walk through this earth, we walk with the understanding of living in his promises. And when we walk in the understanding of living with his promises, we walk with the boldness of his glory. Because his glory is not meek, it's bold. His glory will always light up darkness. It'll, the darkness will flee. It will run from his glory. It, sin cannot stand in his glory. His glory is like this brightness, this shining light, but it's a presence in his glory, in his presence. Because wherever his glory is, he is there as well. Wherever he is, his glory radiates from him. And the more we have of him, the more his glory. I just got a really bad ringing, um, if we could just turn the mids down a bit or something. But wherever his glory is, we'll find him. And wherever we find him, we find his glory. Sometimes people say, well, you shouldn't glorify yourself. No, that's right. But when we live in him, he glorifies you and he glorifies me. Yeah, well, that, you know, you need to be humble about that. Yeah, what does humility look like? What is humbleness? Humbleness and losing yourself for the sake of the gospel, absolutely. True humbleness creates such a boldness in the identity and understanding of who you are created to be. Jesus didn't lose his humbleness when he ran into the temple and overturned the tables because of the defilement of his father's house. He didn't all of a sudden become less humble. He was so fed up, disturbed, bothered by the defilement of his father's house that Jesus, the man of humility, ran in the temple, very strategic, ran in, quickly overturned things and ran back out of there. Where's his father's house? It's you. So maybe we need Jesus to just, in his humility, run in and overturn a few things that are defiling the temple. The neat thing is, is because of the temple that is in us, When Jesus runs into our lives, he comes into our lives and he turns over a few things that are defiling. He stays because he has greater ability in our lives. He doesn't just run away again. And I ask, Father, that the defilement of the temple cease in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the name above all names. Holy Spirit, invade us. Invade means invasion. The invasion of the Holy Spirit is voluntary and sometimes involuntary. If you've ever manifested in the presence of the Holy Spirit when you've not wanted to, you'll know sometimes it's involuntary. But your physical body cannot sustain the presence that has entered in. But invasion is also voluntary. Do you realize that an army plans and strategizes for many, many seasons or not much, much time 
before they invade the enemy's camp. I believe that we are in a strategizing season within our own lives. Why we come to church is so we can strategize personally how to invade the enemy's camp in our own life. <laughs> and that's the humility of Jesus turning over the tables. Right after the baptism of Jesus, he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. The passion of our Father in heaven and our Lord Jesus is to have a people of his very own who are entirely and utterly filled with his presence. That's the desire of the Father. That's the desire of Christ. That you and I live a lifestyle that is utterly filled with his presence, with the presence of God. You realize the more filled we are with the presence, the less filled you can be with the world. His presence does not coexist with the defilement of the temple. His presence gives the opportunity to actually change the defilement into the rejoicing and celebration of who he is. We don't coexist. We don't, we don't say, oh, you know what? Today I'm going to wake up a Christian and tomorrow I'm going to wake up a sinner. You know what? It just doesn't work that way. You say, oh, well, well I love God, but I sinned. I'm a sinner. Well, you know, actually, you're still a Christian if you choose a Christ follower life. Because that sin is forgiven. We just have to have the strength to stop continuing into the sinful nature. Because I believe the more of the presence, the more of the truth, the more of the word of God that we have in our lives, uh, the less likely you're going to live in sin. The less likely you're going to have a sinful nature in any way. God wants to fill us until every fiber of who we are is not only filled, but is also overflowing with the Spirit. That's God's desire, that every fiber of who you and I are is literally overflowing with His Spirit. God did not design us to be perfect, but He designed us to be perfected through Him. That means we're in a lifestyle to be perfected in Him. Are you perfect? Am I? Well, I'm probably the more perfect one in this place, but... Are, are you perfect? Am I perfect? Absolutely not. But that's not an excuse to not live in perfection. Well, I'm just, that's like, that's like, well, I'm just a sinner, so that's my excuse to live in sin. What? What Bible are you reading? You're not a sinner. You're a saint. As soon as you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord, well, if you are this morning not saved, then you are a sinner. But as soon as you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you believe on him. That word believe means to actually put into your being the understanding of what you're putting into being. And, and continually pursuing into him and his presence and into his word. And the more you are a Christ follower, a Christian life, the less you are in sin. Uh, you, you, you go from saved, or from sin to saved. You don't go partial salvation. You don't, you don't say, oh, okay, I, I'm drowning so I have this shirt that I did this Hayek uh, rafting trip with my kids there some years ago, and I had to buy the shirt because on the back of the shirt, it reads upside down and backwards. If you can read this, pull me back in the boat. <laughs> if you're drowning and someone saves you, what does that mean? You're no longer drowning. Unless you've got a really bad person, and they're like, do you believe? Yep. And start drowning you again for answers. But the reality is, is once you're saved, you're no longer drowning. Once you're married, you're married. You're not partially married. You're married until that covenant is broken. I'm a firm believer in marriage. I, you know, I'm 27 years of marriage with my wife, but I know covenants have been broken. I know that. Sometimes it's not your fault. Sometimes it's both of you. Sometimes you've gone through a divorce. But when you're married, you're married. You're in a covenant. You're no longer single, and you no longer have the options that a single person has, but you do have the options of what a married person has. When you're saved, you're no longer the sinner. See, we'll hold it. No, I, I, I have to, to, to live like a saved life. So when I ultimately die, I'll go from glory to glory. Well, that's not actually true because then you weren't in glory. So you actually go from sin to glory. 
You say, well, hold on, what, what are you saying? It, it, my Calvinistic theology is, is saying that, 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 that I'm saved by grace. I understand that, but, but I'm still a sinner. I'm, I'm a wretched, dirty sinner. No, you're not. The cross took all your wretchedness away. His resurrection brought you back into the light and the life of who he is. Oh, you're saved by grace. It was the grace of God that he loved you so much. He sent his son into the world. Absolutely. You weren't saved by your grace. You're saved by his grace. You weren't saved by your deeds. It was his deed that saved you. You can't work yourself to salvation as some, you know, as some uh, religions say. You can't, you, can't, you can't pay penance for it. The penance were already paid. You, you can't, you, you either are saved or you're not. You, this middle of the road, the scripture is very clear. You're, if you're lukewarm, then I spit you out. We're, we're not called to be a lukewarm church. We're called to be a church that has conviction in it. We're called to be a church, a, a gathering, a family that has so much passion and belief in what we believe in through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that we're willing to look at somebody and say, hey, you need to change. But sometimes we just love the little fluffy messages. You're good, you're good, you oh, love you, love you, love you. If I truly love you, I want to say I want to, sometimes you need to spank a child. I'm not saying your children. Some of you are older than I am. Not that many, but a few. <laughs> oh, we can't spank. That's right. I can't spank you. I'm not here to spank you. But I hope I'm here to rattle you, to shake you. And you say, well, that's you, Brent. Now you're back to you. You, 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 you. Well, actually, you chose to be here today. So really, you, that you chose to be here. It's like when you go to McDonald's and you order a McDonald's sandwich, you can't complain that it's not Wendy's. You went to McDonald's, you're the one. Yeah, but I couldn't help myself. I drove my car into the parking lot. It amazes me how many people complain about McDonald's food while they're eating it. <laughs> yes, pray before you eat. <laughs> Sometimes double prayer at McDonald's. You know, I actually miss McDonald's sometimes. Anyone ever have that craving? I go to Mexico or I go into another nation. I'm going to Russia here in another five or six weeks. I don't even know if they have McDonald's over there. I don't know what they do. Actually, I have no idea. I've never been. God did not design you perfect, but he actually designed you to be perfected in him. So don't beat yourself up when you're not perfect. You wake up in the mirror and you look at yourself and you go, oh my goodness. And you say, yeah, it's the goodness of God that you look in yourself in the mirror. We are not to be filled with the Spirit of God one time, but we are to be continually filled up again and again throughout life. I'll be controversial and say, we're not to be saved once, we're to be saved continually. Because what's the word saved? It means sozo. I was brought up once a Christian, always a Christian, and when I backslid as a teenager, they said, well, you weren't really a Christian in the first place. Been there. But you know what? You don't have to tell me you're a Christian or not. That's really between you and God because sometimes words are cheap. They can speak a lot of things. And sometimes we need to hear less of this and we need to see more of that. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Paul is speaking, and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation but be filled with the Spirit. In other words, uh, he's implying that when you're filled with the Spirit, you're happy. Wine gives you a headache afterwards. You're happy for a moment. I'm not against wine, just against the headache. <sighs> happy. That's happy. It means you're not under the influence of something you drink. You're under the influence of the Spirit. The word filled, 
It means to be continuously and constantly filled, overflowing, when Paul said, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts reveals this truth, that the disciples and apostles were constantly experiencing this refilling of baptism experience. The Father delights to filling us to overflowing. He doesn't want to fill us a quarter or halfway. He wants to fill us to where we're overflowing. Overflowing, overflowing, overflowing. Because we're happy, happy, happy people. Welcome. How many of you aren't happy today? Oh, don't put your hands up. How many of you are happy today? Just put your hands up. About 70%. I don't want to be manipulated to put my hand up whenever they preach. Okay, whatever. I'm not manipulating you. I was going to say I'm spanking you, but that wouldn't sound very good either. But no, I'm just kidding. No one laughed at that. I'm not spanking you either. I, I can only look after my own life. I can't look after yours. Actually, so don't tell me all your press. That's actually a good word. <laughs> Am I the only one having fun up here? I'm actually laughing at myself right now. I'm the only one that can look after my own life. I can't look after yours. Isn't that a great pastor's position? Pastor, help me. I can't. I can only bring you truth, but it's not going to set you free unless you choose the freedom of truth. Yeah, but I need counsel. Why? You always need counsel. Like counsel, 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 because I like counsel. Well, that's good. Then read the Bible. Okay, sorry. <laughs> if you're visiting this morning, I'm not always like this. But welcome. We love you. God designed us, I like this, what Bill Johnson says, to be leaky. Leaky. I'm getting drunk. And leak all over the place. Be so full of the presence, you're overflowing. In other words, leak it out. His desire, he desires that every place we go, we leave a deposit of his glory. Turn to John chapter 7, verse 37. John 7, starting in verse 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. If anyone thirsts, if anyone is thirsty, in other words, you're feeling dry, if anyone's thirsty, if anyone desires more, if anyone wants more, if anyone wants greater understanding, if anyone wants greater peace that passes all understanding, if anyone wants renewed mind, anyone wants change in their life, if anyone wants me or you thirst, come to me and drink, says Jesus. And then the answer is verse 38. He who believes in me, so if you come to him, it shall, and you're thirsty, when you come to him, you believe in him. And when you drink of him, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So you take a drink, but out of your heart flows rivers. You take a mouthful of his presence, and out of you flows rivers. It's a multiplication effect that happens when you willfully step in to what he has for you. Verse 39, but, but this he spoke concerning the Spirit. So he's talking about the Holy Spirit at this moment. Whom those believing in him, the Holy Spirit, would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. What had, happen, what had to happen before the Holy Spirit could be given to the believers? Why was the Holy Spirit at this point not given to the believers? Believers, People had to go to him and drink. They had to go to him and drink. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a helper, a comforter, an encourager, and to strengthen us. Anyone ever feel like they, they need a helper? Anyone ever feel like they need a little comforter? How about a little bit of strength? That's the Holy Spirit. That's, that's part of his job. That's, that's what he carries. The Bible who says that the Holy Bible also says that the Holy Spirit has been given to convict the world of sin and righteousness for judgment to come. For he has been here to convict the world of sin and righteousness. And this is where I want to go to today. John chapter 16, starting in verse 5. John chapter 16, verse 5. 
But now I go away to him who sent me, that's Jesus speaking, and none of, oh, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For I do, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So here Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's saying, look, i got to go away. And you're going to mourn going away. You're going to be sad that I'm going away. But I need to go away because when I go away, something more is coming. Verse 8, and when, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, verse 13, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, uh, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He doesn't speak on his own authority. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you, he's speaking on the authority of the Father. And he comes to help guide us into all truth. Verse 14, he will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Huh. Holy Spirit, come. What are we saying? What are we saying? <laughs> Is this speaking without this and this absorbing what's being spoken? We sing, come, Holy Spirit, come. My goodness, what you're saying is the one that has authority from the authority to come with such power to literally do things that the kingdom of heaven is already doing. But in your life, in your family, in your ministry, your church. We know that the Holy Spirit has come to give gifts to the believers so that we can distribute the grace of God throughout the earth. <laughs> I would summarize the work of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit has been given to each one of us to make us more like Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Where have we been created? In Christ. What was the purpose? To walk in good works. To walk in power, to walk in authority, to walk in good works, to help do things for each other, to help be family, to help be sons and daughters, mamas and papas, grandmas and grandpas. He's, he's called us to be family, to do good works. Uh, how many of you love it when you, when you connect with a family that they're all doing good works in the family? It's an amazing experience. It's an amazing thing. And as a parent, I, I get so excited when I see my kids doing good, doing good works. But we're so fearful of this good works thing. Well, he's going to ask me to be a Sunday school teacher. Absolutely I am. So you can be free in the Holy Spirit. He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna raise another offering. Absolutely we are. So you can be free in your giving and get blessed and receive the presence of God in another whole level as you give what's dear to your heart. Well, money's not dear to my heart. Of course not. I'm sure none of you really like money anyways, right? No, I need money. I don't like it. Yeah, right. In Ephesians 2.10, Paul stated that every believer is God's workmanship. Every one of us is God's workmanship. That word workmanship in Greek is the word poema, which means the product of. Poema is the same word from which we get the English words poem and poetry. So... You're a, you're a product of the kingdom. You're a product of the king. And you're basically God's creative work. Looking at some of you is very creative. (laughs) 
I was going to say something about a doctor delivering a baby. And, no, I'm just kidding, but I won't. Yeah, I'm going to, just because, why not? No, I won't. <laughs> we are like the words of a poem that paint a vision of his being. That's what our life is. Like the words of a poem. And the painter, the writer of the poem, has written your life. He's written your purpose. He's written your destiny. It's only yours and my choice on whether we're going to be in his painting picture or the written destiny of his will. Jesus is the model, and we are becoming his portraits. John chapter 16, verse 13. John 16, verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Verse 14, and he will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. What is the title given to the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth? What is the purpose of his guidance to guide us into all truth? How does the Holy Spirit provide this guidance? He will take of what is Jesus and declare it to us. Is anybody getting this? It's powerful. It's powerful. The promises of God are what reverse the rational mind in its unbelief. These kind of promises reverse the rational mind. What's the rational mind? Well, I'm just, I'm just Brent. Yeah, just Brent, you know. Well, maybe your irrational mind, I'm the best, best in the world. No, the rational mind always wants to bring you down to human understanding. Why? Because human thoughts are rational. It, I don't want to go there because something might happen. If I go outside, it's a thunderstorm. I might get struck by lightning. If I get in my car, what happens if I have an accident down the street? What, what, what if? What if? What if? What if I go on that missions trip in July, but I don't have the money to pay for it? And what, 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 if I, what if I even try to get the time off and my boss says I can't? I mean, what happens then? And then he's not going to like me, so I, I might as well not even ask. The promises of God is a stop unbelief. When we hear his promises, we actually shouldn't even have a second thought about it. Because when we have a second thought about what's going to happen because of his promises, we're starting to foster unbelief. His promises are reality. His promises are what he's called us into. His promises are commands that he's given to you and me. But when we start to process with this mindset of unbelief, we start to live in unbelief more than we live in advancement of his future. Unbelief is one of the things that I think is killing the church. It's killing the people. It's killing the Christians. We think it's terrorism. No, it's not. It's unbelief. Those terrorists need Jesus. And guess what? As long as we're alive, we're the ones to be shining light to everyone in this world. Yeah, but, but, but what if, if I fly an airplane? You know what? I'm getting on an airplane this week. And then I come back and I get on another airplane. Yeah, but what about Egyptian air? Yeah, you know what? Egyptian air. If I was in the plane, I would have been speaking in tongues and trying to save every person I possibly could by giving them the gospel. Yeah, but what if I die? You know what? If you die, God is calling you from glory to glory. Yeah, but I'm fearful of dying. Why? You know how beautiful my hair is going to be in heaven? (laughs) And I'm not going to have to take time in the morning to get it there. The promises of God gives opportunity to repent, turn, and embrace the word that inspires genuine faith. The faith of heaven manifests itself in this natural realm as impossibilities become realities. That's how how the kingdom of heaven manifests itself. It takes impossibilities and brings them into realities. Because the reality of the kingdom has no impossibilities. If you have an impossibility in your life, then you're not in his kingdom. Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What is Jesus giving us? 
keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This model we live here on earth is what we, what we, we do, what we hear the Father say and see him do. That's the model we're to live. Today, that's the model we're to live. What we hear the Father say is what we do. It's, it's really not subject to everybody around you, what they're going to think of you. Because when we start to process, well, what is someone going to think of me? Now, I'm not talking about stepping out of the culture of honor. If you stood up right now and started yelling out some blasphemous you know, uh, prophetic lie. Why? Because I know that it won't be blasphemous if it's truly prophetic. If you stood up right now, there are going to be a few people come and say, hey, let's go outside and take you back to the bushes and beat you out. I'm just kidding. No, no, no. <laughs> There's a culture of honor. There's order in the kingdom. There's respect in the house. So I'm not giving you freedom to go disrespect people. That's not what this is about. I'm not giving you freedom to go exercise the authoritative power that you carry when self is indulging it. Or lack of identity. But I am giving you the authority in this house to exercise an entrance into his presence that will radically shift you and shift us as the family shifts together. What does that look like? I don't know. Different for every person. But I know one thing. If you're not changing, you're not living it. Welcome. The happy church. Because I know that true happiness comes from true obedience to Him. And that's a big H. And in my Bible, that means our Lord. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. Ephesians 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're alive together with Christ. And raised up to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Wow. You think you're sitting in a... We need new chairs. Anybody want to invest some money? These chairs we've had for a long time. But you're sitting in the chair with Christ in heavenly places. Doesn't matter where your rear end is sitting. With Him, you're in heavenly places. Doesn't matter where you're driving. With Him, you're in heavenly places. Doesn't matter what your family environment is like. If you have Him in your life, you're in heavenly places. Doesn't matter how your job's treating you. In Him, you're in a heavenly place. But if we let the effect of the treatments around us affect us negatively, there is no negativity in the heavenly places, then we start to lose the heavenly throne room, the heavenly presence. We start to step farther away from the kingdom of heaven at hand. We beat ourselves up. If you don't beat yourself up, someone I'm sure would beat you up if you volunteer. Someone's going to give you their opinion of you, whether you want it or you don't. But that's not who we ask opinion of. I encourage you, don't look to others to try to explain who you are. Look to him who knows who you are. Because if he knows who you are than anybody else that tells you different is lying. It's lying. I've been told I'm the worst dad out there. I've been told I can't father anything. I've been told I'm a false prophet. I've been told many, many things. Maybe I should just dwell on those for a while. I look at my youngest daughter 
singing her heart out on the platform. You know what? I made some mistakes. I did. I'll admit it. I know you think I shouldn't, but I did. But I'm going to admit the mistakes so I can learn and grow to be a better dad, a better father, a better pastor, better prophet, better evangelist, better teacher, better preacher, better whatever. That was my music sign. If you ever see me do that, that's what that means. I could live in my mistakes. Guess who knows them best? Guess who remembers them most? But you know what? I'm not perfect, but I'm in a season to live life, to become perfected in Him. I'm not really that strong anymore. I, I, I don't know, something's happening as you age. Anyone ever felt that? Like you kind of just can't do what you used to do sometimes. I still try hard next day I'm on painkillers and muscle relaxatives. <gasps> Don't try to be who you used to be because that's not what you're called to be. Be who you're called today because that's your destiny. When we have an understanding of the Holy Spirit, my, my next notes are talking about the more we have of this understanding the less sin we actually live in because ultimately that's that's why you're on this earth with a free will to have to have the ultimate choice in your own life of whether you live in the identity of Christ or you live in the identity of man Oh, there's a lot of ministers out there that want to control you with their lack of identity. Because usually a controlling minister or a controlling leader or a controlling husband or a controlling wife or a controlling child or a controlling person, usually they're so controlling because they actually have an identity crisis in their life. And what usually comes up is they speak to others like it's death when it's their own struggle. The reality is, is none of us in here are perfect. But I know the one I'm trying to become. I know the one that models the life for me to live. I know the one, the Holy Spirit, that's going to help me become more like that one. That I'm trying to be a model for. And his name is Jesus Christ. Because he is the life that lived this earth with the best and perfect testimony. He never sinned. You say, oh, wow, you have an amazing testimony, Brent. Look at all the sin you did. No, actually, that's a bad testimony. I like to look at my wife because I don't I, I think she was born a Christian her first breath was I do I love you she's perfect she wakes up and that's what she looks like I'm saying that because I take more time in the bathroom than her now doing my hair Just oh no she's not perfect you know what I don't care what you say because I've made a choice in my marriage in my life she I know is the only one that could survive me 
she's the only one that has the grace to be able to be married to me. Well, you know what? You're the only one. You right now are the only one that has the ability to be married to Christ. To have that groom, perfect groom. None of us can push one way or the other. But I know I can control my life. You can't control me. I, oh, I'm submitted under my eldership, my leadership, my apostolic covering. Absolutely, I'm submitted. They can tell me things and I'll be obedient, to them, but they actually can't control me. Our problem is, is we've used that as a strength to us. Instead of realize that it can become a weakness to us. No one can control me. I'm my own man. Actually, that's a lie. I'm not my own man. I gave my man to him. It's my soul. It's my heart. It's my emotions. It's my free will. What do you mean you still have a free will? No, actually, I don't have a free will anymore. When I said I do to my wife, I do no longer have a free will, a singleness. Well, God gave you a free will. That's right, to choose him. And I freely chose him. And so I have chains. Not chains of bondage. Chains of strength. I'm bound to him. Are you bound to him? Let's all stand. The comforter, the Holy Spirit brings us all the things of the heavens through the blood that was shed on the cross called Calvary through the resurrected power of an empty tomb and his name is Jesus Christ our living Lord and Savior when we have Jesus when we have the Holy Spirit then we've established the relationship with the kingdom of heaven at hand and when we have the relationship of the kingdom of heaven at hand, we don't have fear. We don't have envy. We don't have pride. We don't have doubts. We have joy everlasting, unspeakable joy. We have peace that passes all understanding. In the middle of torments and trials, we have peace. To where in the middle of a war or distraction, people will come running. Why do you have such peace? Well, because I have the peace that passes all understanding. Because what's happening in my little sphere around me is not my understanding unless it's the kingdom come, the will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then I pray that my sphere brings the understanding of what Christ did and our destiny is called to. And so, Father, I pray on this beautiful May Sunday, I ask you, Lord God, that we will be convicted in such a way that we will freely choose your path of righteousness for your name's sake. And I ask, Father, that we get so empowered by your Holy Spirit that we will continually be filled that when we are thirsty, we go to you, Jesus, and we drink and, and, and we become rivers of living water. And I thank you, Father, for the great things that you're doing in this house and the many houses around this world, Father. I thank you for the revivals that are breaking out, Lord God, because every revival has started with the reviving of a person or a group of people together, that their life is no longer dead, but it is alive. And so we have revival in this house because we're not dead, we're alive. And I thank you for I pray, Father God, 
As I head up to Red Deer, Alberta this week, I pray, Lord God, that there will be such a move of your prophetic anointing into this prophetic school that is taking place. I pray, Father, for Alberta, as there's already great things happening in that province. I pray for this nation of Canada. We pray, Lord God, and we say, this is Canada's time. It is Canada's hour. And we thank you for it. And I thank you, Father, that we border one of the greatest nations of the world called United States of America. I thank you, Father, for President Obama, that you have placed him in there. I, I might not agree with some of his morals and his practices, but I know, Father, that you work through all things. And I pray for the next president of America, that it will be a godly individual that will rise up with core values, that will bring America back to the greatness that is destined for it. So that these two great nations called America and Canada that literally were created uh, from slavery to freedom. From bondage, religious slavery, religious bondage to freedom. Our both nations were founded in the word of God. And I don't care who changes what constitution. These nations were founded in the word of God. And I thank you for it, Father. So we lift up America, we lift up Canada. And we say this together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth in Canada, in America, and the world as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Everyone who has hurt us, everyone who has trespassed against us, we forgive them. <laughs> For this is the day that you have made. And in this day, we rejoice and we're glad. It implies you can rejoice without being glad. But rejoice and glad together is what makes this day great. Amen. Amen. I feel like I'm staring at the sun, but I feel no pain.